Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Laurel Trainer, uh, Professor of Psychology, Neuroscience, and Behavior at McMaster University. And I want to welcome you to this session on learning and bonding to the beat. Maybe? <laughs> if we can have the first slide. No, no. Yeah, sorry, the slides aren't showing on the screen here. Ah, okay. There we go. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to thank the organizers of this wonderful uh, events from uh, last night and, and all day today. It's, it's just been um, amazing uh, to have scientists and musicians coming together. Uh, if you were at the, the last uh, session, uh, at uh, I think it was 2 o'clock this afternoon, the discussion was on music education. Uh, and focused more on older children. And what we're going to focus on today is the young kids. So mostly we're going to talk about infants. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the research that we've been doing. And then I'm really happy to uh, introduce, uh, we're going to have Joanne Lowy uh, come and talk. She's a music therapist who specializes with infants uh, who are born uh, premature. And she does just wonderful work. Uh, we're going to have members of the, the DC uh, youth orchestra come and play and talk to us about what it means uh, for them, what music means to them. And then we're going to end with a, a couple of very special people from the Carnegie Hall Lullaby Project, and you'll hear about some of the amazing work um, that they're doing. Okay, so in the beginning, uh, very, take a very young infant, their world is musical. So even the way that we talk to them we use something called infant-directed speech. Uh, so I might say, hello, baby, how are you? And if, you, if I talk to an adult like, like that, you would think there was something seriously wrong with me. But we talk to babies like that all the time. And we call it musical speech because what we put into it is rhythmic patterning and melodic contours. So it's almost as if we're changing the speech into music. We also sing to babies in special ways that we don't tend to sing necessarily in, in other circumstances. And some of our research has shown that mothers and fathers use the way that they sing to babies to help the baby control their state. You all know that, that babies and young kids are not very good at controlling their, their state. It's something that takes many years to, to develop. But music is something that we use um, every day like this. So we asked mothers in this study to sing the same song. In one case, as a lullaby to put their baby to sleep, and in another case as a play song to engage with their baby. And see if you can tell which is which. Okay, and here's the other one. So which was the lullaby? The first one. Really obvious. Right? In psychology, we often um, are happy if you know, we get a little bit of an effect here. Everybody that we ever ask is always 100% correct at knowing which is a lullaby and which is a play song. So these are enormous differences. And they tell us that parents and caregivers are using music to help their babies regulate their state. Infants might not look like they're doing much from a young age, but in fact, they have musical preferences from very early on. And one of the preferences they have is for consonants over dissonance. So I'll just show you a little video clip here. We, we took a, a little Mozart uh, piece, and we changed some of the intervals in it to make them dissonant instead of consonant, the way Mozart had written it. And we gave babies alternative listenings to these two versions. And the baby could keep the version, every time they heard one of the versions, they could keep it on as long as they looked. Uh, and I'll, you'll see how that happens in the video here. So we flash a light, and the infant will look um, in the direction of, the, of the, the light and toy. As long as the infant looks, they get to hear the piece. Now the light's flashing on the other side. It's off the screen, so you can't see it.
So babies have, we, we do about 10, 20 trials of this and see what babies' listening preferences are. And we've shown that from very, very early, as early as we can measure, they prefer consonant over dissonant. So they, are, they have these what seem to be innate uh, preferences. Music is also special in that it can soothe babies. Uh, and of course, parents use this around the world uh, every day. And uh, a study done from Sandra Trehub's lab showed that compared to, to talking to an infant, singing could keep an infant happier for about twice as long as talking to them. So music is really important in the lives of these young infants. Now, don't get too scared by this. The baby is smiling, as you can see. Um, we've done studies showing that musical experiences from very early on, from the first months of life, actually shape the brain. So you don't have to wait until a kid is six and in school uh, for music to have a, a big effect on them. And in fact, these very early experiences that they have um, are really powerful. So for example, if you heard uh, Dr. Collins talking uh, earlier uh, in the last session about you know, he, how young he was uh, uh, when he experienced music and Renee Fleming talking about her parents playing music uh, when she was in, in the cradle, those early experiences are probably really critical uh, for brain development. So in this study, we took infants who were six months of age and we randomly assigned them to either an active music class in which the infants and the, par and the parents um, played music together, or a passive music listening experience where they came in and they simply played uh, at, with blocks and balls and so on. So they had a social experience and we just played music in the background and I have to confess, we played Baby Einstein uh, <laughs> CDs for them uh, because they were marketed to make your baby smarter and so we thought, well, we'll see if, if that's true compared to an active uh, listening experience. And then before and after, we measured infants' brain waves uh, using EEG. And this is basically what happens. The, the mom is filling out a uh, consent form and so on. We measure the baby's head. We distract them with something like Big Bird. And this net that we're going to put on the head is actually very comfortable. It's uh, just made of geodesic stretchy elastics between sponges that contain the, the electrodes in which we can measure the electric fields. And when the baby's distracted, we put it on their head and we adjust it, make sure everything is connected. And then the baby is usually very happy. Once it's on, you hardly feel that it's on at all. And with this, we can measure their brain responses. So in the top graph, you see the two groups, this group that had the music, active music experience and the group that had the passive music experience. And there's no significant differences between their brain responses at six months. But at 12 months, if you look closely, you can see that the, the red, which is the uh, group that had the active music experience, the brain responses to sound are a bit earlier and they're a bit larger. So already we can see in the infancy period the effects that music training is having on the brain. So in this study, we also measured a number of other behavioral aspects and we found that infants who were in the active music classes had more advanced early language. And this really consists of measuring their communicative gestures, which is highly correlated with how their language is going to evolve over the next couple of years because at 12 months, infants are not saying very many words. And what you can see is at time one, at six months, uh, they're making very few gestures, that's normal, but by 12 months, the kids in the active music classes were making a lot more gestures, communicative gestures, than uh, kids who were not uh, in that. We also looked at how much they fussed and cried, and we found that after this music class, those who, who were in that class showed less crying and fussing. How willing were they to approach new objects? Well, the kids in the, in the um, music class were much more willing to uh, approach new objects in that they showed less distress when they were shown a, a novel object. They also smiled and laughed more, and they were more easily soothed. So the music experience was not only having an effect on their uh, brain, 
responses, but these very, very important uh, measures of how well they were doing uh, socially and emotionally uh, were enhanced in the kids with music classes. And this is just a video of one of the, this is Elliot, who was 12 months at the time. So in the music classes, the parents always held the kids' hands to play the xylophone. So this is the first time Elliot was given the mallets to play by himself. And for those of you who work with infants, this is incredible uh, Good job. for a 12-month-old. He's even playing. trying to do the opposite hand motion, yeah. which a 12-month-old um, uh, usually can't do. And you see he also does a gesture of crossing the mallet. Elliot, Elliot. And that's the signal that his turn is you done, like the play? that is used in the class, and the xylophone is going to go to the next uh, participant. So just the six months of, of uh, music and, and uh, parent uh, singing and, and uh, rhythm playing has profound effects. So I want to focus on rhythm a little bit. This uh, last night and today, we've uh, been talking a lot about the importance of, of rhythm. And I think that's true also in the infancy period. So we can ask questions like, why does music make us want to move to the beat? We've been hearing a lot about that uh, here. How are rhythms processed in the brain? Why do rhythms affect us so powerfully? And how early in development are we affected by rhythms? And that's the question I really want to think about here. But just to start, many biological systems are rhythmic. Uh, Mickey Hart. Uh, talked very eloquently about that uh, this morning. We locomote, we walk, we run rhythmically, our heartbeats are rhythmic, speech is rhythmic, um, our brains run on, on rhythms. So, so rhythms are just ubiquitous in um, biological systems. And rhythmic movement is actually very primitive. So a jellyfish, for example, can execute exquisite rhythmic movement. Um, and the jellyfish only has a few neurons. Some people think a jellyfish doesn't really even have a brain because it doesn't have enough neurons to really constitute a brain. And yet, it can execute exquisite rhythmic movement. So the circuits that are needed to execute rhythmic movement are not complicated compared to many other things that go on in our brain. And there's another indication that it doesn't take very many neurons <laughs> to execute rhythmic movement. Uh, but you can, if you want, do a lot more intricate things, and this is actually me dancing at my wedding. So. <laughs> okay, so what about young infants? Well, they don't, they're not really motorically mature enough yet to really um, move precisely in time to the beat, but very often if you play them a beat, they will move. You guys ready? I think when you watch something like that, you feel pretty sure that infants do respond uh, to rhythms. So why are rhythms powerful? Why are they so important? Well, one of the big things about rhythm is because a rhythm is regular, you can predict when the next beat is going to happen. Right? So if I clap one, two, three, you know exactly when four is coming. Okay? So, you, so they allow you to predict. And that's really important. If you think about it, in our lives, we spend most of our time predicting the future. So you want to know, is it going to rain today? Do I need to take an umbrella? Um, when I'm talking, your brain, you may not be, con you are not conscious of it for the most part, but every word that I say, you're predicting, your brain is predicting what I'm going to say next. Okay? And if I say, you know, I like my tea with socks. When I say the word socks, your brain does a what? You know, and we does a little electrical activity in the auditory cortex that we can measure with EEG because your brain was predicting that I was going to say milk or, or cream or something like that, not socks. So when 
the brain is continually predicting, and when it makes a wrong prediction, then all sorts of processes happen in, in the brain because the brain then has to update its knowledge of the world based on what it has just learned uh, that it didn't know before. It didn't know that I liked my tea with socks. Now it does. Uh, so prediction is intimately involved in learning. And rhythms, because of their regularity, you can predict when you think the next important information is going to happen. And that's just really powerful. So that's one of the reasons why rhythms are just so important. And just to give a modern day example of, of prediction, see if the pointer works here. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that, but this uh, basketball player up here is trying to score on this net. And you see there's a big open place here. So he's going to predict that this player is going to try and move there. And he's got to, he has to throw the ball here before he knows that this player is going to arrive there. So he has to predict that this player is going to go there. Right? If he makes a wrong prediction, they're not going to score. And likewise, this guy has to predict that he's going to throw the ball there, even though he doesn't have eyes in the back of his head and he may not know that there's no, oops, that there's no players there. Um, so life is all about prediction. Prediction allows you to be in the right place at the right time. Another thing that rhythms allow you to do is organize incoming information. So this is, you may have seen these linguistic trees. We can do the same thing with music. So the cat in the hat um, knows some good tricks. Uh, each of those words takes uh, place one after the other. And the thing about sound, so whether it's music or whether it's speech, is that once a sound has happened, a speech phoneme on a word has happened, the next word overwrites it in your auditory um, processing uh, in the brain. And you can't go back and re-listen for the most part. Okay, so in the visual world, often you can go back. If something happens over there and I, I'm surprised by it, I can look back and it may not have changed very much and I might be able to, to, to resample what was going on over there. For the most part, we don't have that option in the auditory system. Once the sound has happened, it's gone. So you have to organize the sounds as they come in um, into phrases, into sentences, in, in language and in music, into phrases and rhythmic patterns and so on. So you have to do it online. And so without rhythm, we really couldn't do speech or music. And then the third thing that sometimes gets overlooked is attention. So if you're playing in a string quartet, for example, or quintet in this case, um, you always have to be attending to what everybody else is doing. And the rhythms really help you um, to do that. OK, so getting back to the brain, we have how do neural circuits in the brain entrain to rhythms? Well, here's an incoming or an EEG signal that we can measure in response to something that happened in the brain. Uh, and we can break it down. This EEG signal has fast oscillations in it and slow oscillations. So here's a slow oscillation. Here's a fast oscillation. So that if you add them all up, you get this EEG signal in the brain. So we can start to look at all of the different frequencies that the brain uh, is producing. And when we do this, we see that different frequencies in the brain have different functions. So what's shown here on the top, these notes represent the incoming rhythm. This is the auditory stimulus that you're listening to. And then the brain entrains. This is that slow rhythm here. The brain actually entrains to that rhythm. Then we have this fast rhythm that's called beta. And what's it, it doing? It's way, way faster. It's about 20 times a second, way faster than any rhythm that you could really perceive. But it has to do with attention. And the beta, you can see the amount of energy that you have in beta gets bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. And when the beta band is big, you're really attentive. And when it's small, you're inattentive. So you know, around two or three times a second, your attention is going up and down and up and down. You're not really aware of it. 
but your attention is going up and down all the time. And so musicians know if you're going to play a wrong note, should you play it on a strong beat or should you play it on a weak beat? A strong beat, why? Because people won't notice it as much if you play on a weak beat. And the reason for that is their attention is not as strong on the weak beats as it is on the strong beats. So your attention is actually going up and down all the time. And what's interesting is that happens not only in the auditory areas, but also in motor areas in the brain. So what about infants? Well, infants, we've shown that infants actually have connections between auditory and motor areas even before they can coordinate their own movements to the beat. And so the way we looked at this was we noticed that if you take a six beat rhythm pattern, there are two basically different ways that you can hear it. You can hear it as two groups of three. You can hear one, two, three, one, two, three. Or you can hear it as three groups, three groups of two. You can hear one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay? And Leonard Bernstein alternated between those two interpretations. Okay, so we made use of that. We <coughs> played infants, basically an ambiguous rhythm. It's a six beat rhythm pattern, but you could hear it in three or you could hear it in two. And what we did to show that the, aud the motor system is related to the auditory system is we bounce, this is Jessica Phillips Silver, who was a graduate student of mine at the time. And in this case, she bounced some infants on every third beat of this rhythm pattern. And it's the same infant here, but in the study, it was different infants. She bounced on every second beat. Okay, so those infants heard exactly the same thing, but half of them were bounced on every second beat as if it was a waltz rhythm, and half were bounced on every second beat as if it was a march rhythm. And then we did a preference test, a behavioral preference test, like I showed you at the beginning with the consonants and dissonants. And the way that infants were bounced influenced what they preferred to listen to. So if they were bounced on every second beat, they preferred to listen now to a rhythm pattern with accents on every second beat. If they were bounced on every third beat, they preferred to listen to a rhythm pattern with accents on every third beat. So the way that we moved them, the way that they were bounced, affected how they interpreted that rhythm pattern. So that shows that there are these auditory motor connections already in young infants. OK, the other thing that we know is that if something goes wrong with timing or rhythm in the brain, it can affect all kinds of, of um, outcomes. So you've heard, you heard, if you went to Nina's talk uh, this morning, uh, you heard about language problems that, that are associated with, with rhythms, uh, rhythm processing problems. So in dyslexia, what we've shown is that the brain does not entrain well to rhythms. What's shown in the, in the blue here so this is a simple rhythm pattern. Here's one beat, and here's the second beat. The blue shows uh, people without dyslexia, and their brain isn't training very well. They're showing maximal attention at the onset of the beats. Here are people with dyslexia. Their brains are actually doing the opposite. They're paying more attention at times when they shouldn't be paying attention than at times when, they, when the most important information is happening. So we start to see how when a brain is out of tune rhythmically, it can actually have quite devastating consequences. And we now know from a number of studies and in quite a few labs that providing a rhythmic prime increases sentence comprehension. So just playing a rhythm before a sentence starts uh, can help kids with, dys with dyslexia. And also, music rhythm training can improve language outcome. Rhythms can also help children with autism to organize their, their sensory world, and, and uh, many music therapists um, have worked on, uh, work with kids uh, every day who, who have autism. 
So just in the last uh, minute or two here, I want to talk about the rhythms and social development. We, we have rhythms whenever we want to experience a common emotion, and we know that music, making music together and moving together uh, makes adults trust each other and like each other more. If you were here last night, uh, I showed uh, these videos, but I'll just quickly show you uh, them again. So in this case, um, in this study, we bounced infants either in sync or out of sync with an adult. So this is what the in sync bouncing looks like. And then immediately afterwards, we measured whether the infant was willing to help that adult. So this infant bounced in sync with the experimenter. Yeah, and indeed he helped her. So in this case, the experimenter bounced out of sync with the infant. She's, in this case, bouncing too fast. And indeed, this infant doesn't help. So not only does, uh, do rhythms help organize incoming information and um, help us with processing language and music and attention and learning, but they also have social consequences. And it starts very, very early in life. OK, so infants process rhythms. Rhythmic structure promotes predictability, organization, and attention. Processing rhythms helps language learning. Rhythms help people with autism to organize sensory information. And infants use synchronous movement to help learn to navigate their social world and decide who to trust and who to befriend. So that's just a little bit of the, the work that I hope convinces you that music is absolutely critical uh, for young infants. And so what I want to move to next is looking at using music to help our very youngest citizens and their parents, and that is premature infants. And we're really fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Joanne Lowy. She's the director of the Louis Armstrong Center for Music and Medicine at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. And I'll welcome her to come out and uh, talk about her research. Hello. From New York. And from Louis. Louis is our big boss for 25 years. We've been doing clinical research sessions at the bedside in the community. And we've been studying carefully the nut of the chocolate. I love chocolate, which is the music. Um, there's lots of studies that have been done that have looked at music and called it music therapy, but it's not music therapy because it's not undertaken by a music therapist who has training to assess the exact intervention of the music, how it's chosen, why it's chosen, when it's applied, for how long it's applied. So I come today representing AMTA and also the I am, I am, are you, the International Association for music and medicine, where we work with doctors and nurses to really define how music medicine is selected. And we also like to tuck in the music therapy to that medical research. This is my team. I travel a lot, so I bring all of them here to the Kennedy Center. We have a doctor on staff. We work with neonatologists, nurse practitioners, radiation oncologists. Um, every year we train interns. This is last year's batch, and this week we start with the new. We also have research fellows. And I think it's important to say, especially because there are beginning researchers here, that research takes tremendous support. So we feel blessed to be growing a clinical and research community. 
So today we're going to look at before those babies get real cute, although they're cute in the womb. But it's interesting to think about in medicine, how did we treat neonates? And it was Alexandre Lyon, an MD from Paris in the 1800s in France, that developed this very sterile but warm incubator. And it was thought, put them in and don't touch them. But now we know, especially with premature infants, that that last phase of being in the womb is critical. And so researchers have compared babies that came out early to babies that remained in the womb. And it turns out that there's a lot that happens in the last phase. So the model I'm going to present today is a neonatal music therapy model, and it's three-pronged. Because one thing we know for sure in music therapy, besides all that decision-making about the live music, and it's largely live, is that we can't treat in a vacuum. So when we're talking about babies, we're talking about music psychotherapy with fragile parents who may have trauma. And we're talking about the unit. And if the neonatal unit is loud with noise, the growth is not going to happen well. Just a bit of statistics. There's roughly six, 16 million babies born preterm each year. So that's more than one in 10 babies. And Dr. Amy Telsey let me this slide. At 25 weeks, the brain is about the size of a coffee bean. But as time goes and the baby develops, by 25 weeks, Sorry, by 40 weeks at term, the infant is the size of a walnut. So that's really interesting to think about the brain growth as expanding so quickly. And we know now that those incubators, though they're warm and quiet, if we just have that, the baby is not going to develop, that the baby needs stimulation, that the neural pathways need to have sound need to have rhythm. So Dr. Fred Schwartz taught me this. He calls it a prenatal university inside the womb. There's whoosh. There's resonance of mother's heartbeat. There's repetition. We just heard about predictability. We also know that small intervals, I see a baby in the audience, <laughs> capture more knowledge for the baby than big jumps. And Laurel Trainer writes about her work, in her work, about music and culturation. And we know now that that actually starts in the womb. There's a recent study that talks all about the enculturation. And we know from the research that small steps, that the womb sounds, and that familiar content and familiar voices are critical. So this is why it's so important to work with the parents, too. The music isn't just a battery that we put in for babies. We're working to understand through music therapy assessment the trauma of the parent, if any, but also that special recipe, that song that's going to be meaningful, that will be enjoyable for them to use. It's almost epigenetic. It's in the blood. It's in the body, and it's music that will willingly help attachment. So multiculture is critical. This is actually the use of rhythm. We use a gato box now, and we do it live because live music is safest. Respiratory rate changes, heartbeats change. We need to have a music therapist there to change with those biorhythms. Recorded music is stagnant. It can't change. The volume can be dangerous. So I wanted to show you this baby who is with the music therapist. The baby is very upset. The music therapist is using the interval of a major third. She's also in training her breathing to the baby's cry. And you'll see how quickly the baby stops crying. And in, in an incubator, these moments of calm, 
and quiet alert are critical. So third. So it's not your opera. It's actually very difficult to sing like that, which is why we have a training for music therapists that work in the neonatal intensive care unit. And they're taught to actually sing with long, non-vibrotic voice. And they're taught to identify the tonic, the, the ground note that the baby's crying on. This will evoke the most attuned response. And this is what we want to help bonding. And this is, the, in my mind, how the brain encodes. And the research is showing that the development of an attuned attachment is critical. And so this is improvisational, creative music therapy. And this is part of the training. So we wanted to see the impact. So with 11 hospitals, and 272 neonates, we explored rhythm, breath, and lullaby. First, and maybe most important, the favorite song of the infant. Second, the rhythm, which I'm gonna show you. And third, the womb sounds. We knew already that lullabies worked well, but nobody ever studied the lull and the bai and how it's chosen. So we had the parents decide, which is best practice in music therapy, the lullaby. And we also did entrainment, which is what you just watched. The music therapist took a chunk of the lullaby, the hook, if you will, and repeated it in response to the baby's vitals. Then we used an ocean disc, which created the womb sounds, and we entrained it to the baby's breathing and a gato box without a mallet to look at the interval of a third and the impact of rhythm on the heart. It was pretty stringent. It was two week period before, during, after. Those were our short term results. And then our long term was over a two week period. And this is our table one. We looked at common diagnoses respiratory distress, clinical sepsis, SGA, and we took a lot of measurements. But what we found, the juice, was that the lullaby actually helped heart rate. The respiratory rate improved with the ocean disc significantly. Shh, shh, shh. I guess that's why people go to the beach when they need to relax. We are all water. And then the caloric intake, the feeding improved and the parental stress went down because it's no use having a parent who's completely stressed out trying to sing. And it's any song that they bring in. So we've learned Russian lullabies. I'm gonna show you how we change lullabies into songs of kin. I mean, they're born unstable. It's an unstable world and it's a roller coaster every day. So it's anything that's gonna give him more stability is fine with me. This is Pam Bellock of the New York Times. Andrea Zalkin gave birth to Hudson only 26 and a half weeks into her pregnancy. His early weeks are spent mostly in an incubator. But here at New York's Beth Israel Medical Center, Andrea isn't just waiting for her son to grow and strengthen. She's using music, a specially calibrated song, and some instruments played by a music therapist to help calm and stabilize her baby and create an environment that may help his development. The Remo Ocean Disc replicates the whooshing that Hudson hired in Mama's womb all those months. And a new so. study of 11 hospitals, including Beth Israel, shows this kind of responsive music therapy can help lower a baby's heart rate and breathing rate, increase oxygen absorption, 
improve sucking behavior that's needed for proper feeding. I was like, Hudson, what's that? <laughs> and help a baby sleep better. All of these things are important to help premature babies develop. And then we're also providing this womb sound as well that we're in training to its respiratory rate to help stabilize that. In an isolate, the sound is actually, um, uh, it seems like it would block out noise, but it, because the sound bounces off the walls, it's much louder inside and um, the sounds aren't necessarily pleasant with everything clanking around, but out here he's listening to my heartbeat, he's listening to instruments that sound like heartbeats. The so a lot of time is spent with the parents showing them the instruments. We actually use the ocean disc to help them relax. So this study we were very happy was published on the front page of the New York Times. And then we worked carefully with Remo Belli who helped us really refine the instruments to get more padding to the ocean drum to make it a disc, to use just the interval of a third with the gato box. And of course, the mother and father, they can't go in that, that kit. That's the most critical relationship because it's a parallel process of their stress. And if we can relax the parents and help them change their favorite lullaby into a three, four, six meter with repetition, then they'll be more calm when they work with the babies and the babies will attach more easily. So one of the fruits of being a music therapist is being able to work with geniuses like Remo Belli because he was interested in the music and it's a feedback system for us. It's not just playing any instrument. We adapt the instrument for the babies, for whatever population we're working with. So this is the kit he's made us. Uh, there's a gato box, an ocean disc, it's sterile, comes in a bag. It's, and we've created a whole training called First Sounds, Rhythm, Breath, and Lullaby, and a whole syllabus. So we're building music therapy, and we're trying to get every baby in the world in every NICU. It's going on in lots of different countries with lots of different music therapists. And doctors and nurses are helping us institute this program. This was China two years ago. Even in places where students themselves have not been allowed to play music, if we have a medical reason for the music being able to help. So we've talked a little about the infants, and we've addressed the caregiver stress. Look at this baby conducting the music therapist. And look how this baby's hungry for the vibration. He's nestled his feet on the wood of the guitar. The entrainment of the music in the moment is medically efficient because we can monitor the heart rate, respiratory rate, but it also helps us with pain and trauma. My colleague, Alexandra Ustin, is doing a lot of work with pain. Um, so co-regulation can really be enhanced with music therapy. And we include fathers too, because fathers have largely been left out of the studies. Mother's milk, mother's voice, mommy and me. We train a lot of male music therapists, and we're all looking for evidence and in particular, looking at the respiratory rate and rhythm's impact, because many of the babies have respiratory issues, and there's a rhythm of the body. So actually, Laurel's work on infant-directed singing has influenced us. See, I have consistent, I have predictable. I didn't take that from her slideshow. I didn't see it. We are growing this field. And we're growing it with you here, understanding what we're doing. So some of my peers have written about how important it is to write about the music. Sherry Robb has given us guidelines, what needs to be included. Frederica Hasselbach is using fMRIs. And we're starting to build the science of what we understand. And what we at the Louis Armstrong Center have been able to show, without a doubt, is that a lullaby created with parents. We call it a song of kin, because it's not any old lullaby, 
because if it's 4-4, four, four, it's a marching beat. We change it to 3-4-6-8. We take the chunk of it, slow it down, make it consistent, and take the cultural melody. And it's delicious because it's always different. Helen Schumark talks a lot about parent infant time. We need to extend those times with live music. It doesn't matter if the parent can sing. The more opportunities we make, especially at bedtime or in the morning, for consistent, repetitive music will allow the brain to map. Babies recognize mother's voice from the womb and father's voice as well. So it's essential, even in pregnancy, to begin making this song of kin so those neural patterns will develop. And then when we work with parents to have a music psychotherapy approach to assess their trauma, to assess the newness of a baby, to assess the diagnosis, and how we can work with stress and music therapy with them. Because we know from our music therapy studies that there's a lot of stress that goes along with parenting. Some of you are nodding. So the music can help. We've spent a long time studying this song of kin and the methods and when to use it and how to develop it and including fathers. Very critical because the attachment starts in the womb. And if we can continue that prenatal university using rhythm, breath, and lullaby, using the chunk of the lullaby, which is part of the song of kin, then the babies will grow quicker. And we see from the good studies all weekend that their brain is going to have more capacity. But most important, that they're going to know how to be social beings and co-regulate with others. Remember, trauma is a disruption of the self. And how we reconcile trauma with music is not just listening passively, but part partaking with someone else. I'm going to conclude just by saying that we've already know, we already know that lullabies are much more efficient in most cases than pharmacological sedation for sedating babies and infants. It's part of our protocol. So sleep is critical. So the last prong, sleep is the environment. And if you've ever been in an ICU, the noise, the beeps at the pump, the people talking, this is the third prong. We have to bring down the noise. But we don't just do it by telling people to be quiet. And we can't lower the alarms. So the last part of our training is actually developing music that will modulate the impact of stress in the ICUs because there's lots of sources of noise. And if we play with the environment, and if we play nurses and doctors' favorite tunes, change them to three, four, six, eight, that will make a more inclusive unit. And we're all about inclusivity, because we know noise causes a sleep deprivation. People need it to have cell building. People need it to rest their brains so that neural network can develop. So that was the last prong. Our new study is focusing right now on neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is addiction is one of the biggest problems in our country. So these babies are born often seizuring, screaming, um, unable to calm, unable to sleep. So we are going to, hopefully, in the near future, develop music therapy methods for these babies that come with so many different symptoms. It's been a pleasure telling you just a little piece of our research and clinical practice here today. If you ever are happening to come to New York City and you'd like to see some of this work or do training with us in music therapy, please give us a call or a visit. And now we'll move on with the program. Thank you. Yes. So thanks very much, Joanne. That was very 
uh, very inspiring. And we're now going to turn to um, children who are a little bit older uh, and look at what happens to children who have experienced music uh, from a young age. Um, those of you from the DC area probably know that you have an amazing organization here, the DC Youth Orchestra. Uh, their mission statement is music for young people, achievement for life. They have actually 10 different orchestras. They offer group lessons. Uh, they're very inclusive. 76% of the people, uh, the children, uh, identify as persons of color. 29% uh, uh, of the kids that they serve qualify for reduced school lunches. Over the past, this is incredible, over the past uh, 50, 60 years, since 1960, they've reached over 50,000 youths. That's amazing. They've toured 22 countries. They've played for presidents. They've won many awards. So it's really an incredible organization. And we're going to hear today from uh, four people uh, in the four um, people in the DC Youth Orchestra, Noah, Anton, Rosemary, and Sarah. If you would like to come out, we'd love to hear your music. Thank you. 
So thanks very much. That was incredible. So if you don't mind, I just want to ask you a few questions. Um, we'll start with a very easy one. So how many years have you been playing? Okay. Um, my name is Noah Pan Steyer. I'm 12 years old, and I've been playing the violin for nine years. Hello. My name is Anton. I'm 13 years old, and I've been playing the violin for eight years. Hi. My name is Rosemary Sellers. I'm 12, and I've been playing the viola for seven years. Hello, my name is Sarah Simra, and I've been, I'm 13 year old, years old, and I've been playing the cello for four years. So pretty impressive. <laughs> how many, how many, how long have you actually been playing this piece together? We met together at the DCYOP's Chamber Orchestra summer camp, and we've been playing for three weeks. Three weeks. Right. So is it hard to play an instrument? Do you practice a lot? Yeah, it's really hard to play an instrument, but once you learn how to sight read, it gets easier. And no matter how good you are, you always have to practice. Right. Just a fact of life, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I'm curious about is, I know you play an orchestra where you have a conductor. Um, how is it different playing in a chamber group like this when you don't have a conductor? Um, well, uh, in an orchestra, the conductor is the one who uh, decides how the music is supposed to sound like. In a chamber music group, everybody gets to put their opinion in to decide how the music is supposed to come along. Right. And do you have a preference? Not really. <laughs> Just like everything, okay. So, well, what do you like most about playing? Maybe, Noah, you could start. Uh, well, playing the violin lets me express my feelings and when I need an outlet. And it also, uh, it, it also helps me stay calm. What I like most about playing the violin is that you get to express yourself with the different styles of music that you play. What I like most about playing an instrument, especially playing with you all, is that um, you can make new friends basically wherever you are. What I like most about playing an instrument is the challenge, um, being able to come home and work through something and excel at it, and I also love creating a beautiful piece of music together. Wonderful. So, how does music help? Does music help with other aspects of your life? So, I know you all like to play, but does it help with other aspects of your life as well? Um, at least I think it does. And um, it helps you like meet new people and, as they've said, express your feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, music helps me stay calm in times where um, I might be a little nervous. Also, it helps me make friends, like I've met all these great people here around me. Uh, well, music is definitely a very big part of my life in itself, um, but it helps me work. I love listening to music, and um, also, I guess it's a great skill for, lang for learning languages. I speak uh, Spanish and I'm also learning Chinese. And um, I find it a lot easier to pronounce things in both languages. Uh, music, in learning a piece of music, I have to work through to get, get to the, to make the piece of, to play it at the end, um, and it helps me know that I can work at a problem small steps at a time until I reach a big goal. Mm. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I understand that uh, you guys play a lot of concerts, and that recently you played at the World Gas Conference, right? So, and I understand that you played both American and Korean music. Is that true? 
Yes. And uh, why was that? Well, this year's uh, National World Gas Conference was held in uh, Washington, D.C. So we played uh, two pieces, Hoedown, which is a rodeo piece, and uh, the variations on a Korean uh, music. So that represents how this year we had it in Washington, D.C., and next year it will be held in Korea. Uh, another thing that music does really well is bring people from all around the world together, and that's a very big part of that. Great. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, I have one microphone on, so I'm not going to use this one to talk. Um, so we've been hearing about music in premature infants and, and how playing uh, music really affects uh, children's lives. And we're going to end the session today with um, hearing, hearing about the Carnegie Hall Lullaby Project. This project, um, I think, really demonstrates how, you know, I do complicated scientific research that takes me years to figure out answers to problems, and just how some of this stuff can be applied in the real world in very simple ways that can make huge differences in people's lives. So I'm really happy uh, to have today Emily Egan and, and Denny Palmer Wolf, and they're going to talk to you about their amazing work uh, with the Carnegie Hall Lullaby Project. Greetings, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. My name is Emily Egan, and I want to thank Dr. Trainer for having us on this panel and to everyone on the Sound Health uh, Conference. We've just had a wonderful time listening, and we're excited to share with you about our lullaby project. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction, and then my colleague, Denny Palmer Wolf, is going to talk more about the impact of the project, and we're going to end with some singing. So, um, the Lullaby Project began in 2011 in the Bronx, and it stemmed from a partnership that Carnegie Hall already had with Jacoby Hospital. And this was a hospital where we had already been working with teens on various songwriting projects, and the staff in conversation told us that there was another population that they felt like they wanted to uh, work with, and that was young expectant mothers or new mothers who were really experiencing a lot of stress in their lives, teen mothers um, with various challenges, and this gave them a lot of trouble attaching to their babies. So they asked us what we could do, what we thought might work for them. Um, in response, Carnegie Hall teaching artist Thomas Cabanis, who's a composer and a wonderfully creative person, came up with the idea of doing some lullaby writing with these moms. And he proposed this as a way to help the young parents express their feelings, whether they were positive or negative, but really use the song as a chance to help the, the parents connect through artistic experience. And the process was very simple. We asked the parents to write a letter with their hopes and dreams to their children. We usually circled the phrases that came up or words that we felt were special. We set those to a little tune, and pretty soon we had what we knew was a very, what, what instinctively felt like it was a very powerful experience. And I can say this firsthand because I had the lucky fortune of being a participant in this project as well as an artist because I was hired to come uh, to come help write songs, but by the time we actually did the project, I was five months pregnant. So I got to, to experience the Lullaby Project firsthand, and um, it really changed me as a person and as a singer, as well as, um, as it, it gave me something that I, I still use to this day. I took my daughter to first grade the other day, and I was thinking about the lullaby that I wrote for her when she was a baby, and I drew her close to me and sang it to her, and I thought, this lullaby project really has affected me personally as well as the, uh, the people that we've worked with. So I can tell you firsthand that uh, it's been wonderful, and it's been wonderful to watch it grow. Uh, since the pilot in 2011, we've grown tremendously. First, we uh, explored other locations in New York City where parents were facing challenges. We, we went to shelters, correctional facilities, and high school programs for young parents, and also neonatal units. And then we began to grow nationally and internationally. So over the past seven years, we have written 
in, in partnership with various parents and organizations. They're, the Lullaby Project has generated over 1,000 lullabies in over 20 languages, and we have over 20 national and international partners. And in all of these settings, people really make the Lullaby Project their own. We work closely with community organizations and staff and offer families the lullaby experience as a way to, to help them face challenges such as the homelessness crisis in Seattle or the refugee crisis in Greece. And uh, in all of these, the heart really remains the same. It's using singing and songwriting as tools to help bonding and caregiving and maternal health and to en enhance the positive and, and, and uh, empowering experience of parenting by giving parents a, ch a chance to be creative and use self-expression as a tool. And as one mother uh, that I remember working with always said, this project is so small and yet it's so big. So we're going to, um, Denny is going to talk to you a little bit more about the outcomes and big picture issues with the project and then we're gonna dive into some singing so you can get a chance to feel what it's like to, to have a, a little moment of the Lullaby Project. Um, good afternoon. Um, this might be the um, tribute to lullaby day. Um, <laughs> um, I often think about lullabies as an example of those phenomena that are really um, evidence of women's wisdom. They have known for centuries that lullabies make a difference and science might someday catch up to that. Um, so my job at Carnegie Hall, um, is to be the eyes and ears for projects. Uh, I'm a documenter, uh, developmental researcher, um, particularly in the very early stages when we don't yet quite know what we're looking for or what we might find. And so it's been my great good fortune to work with people like Emily, um, who represent a very important um, hybrid kind of person in this space. They have the, also the eyes and ears of an artist, but also are extremely curious and active partners with a researcher. And so they are willing to talk about what they experience, just uh, what they've noticed, what moms whisper to them upon leaving the session. And so the partnership has really grown. Um, uh, out, out of those kinds of conversations. One of the very first things that we noticed in the project was that the moms were coming to us, exactly as Emily said, out of extremely stressful conditions. Um, shelters, homelessness, um, trying to make their way with infants and younger children through a rehabilitation process. Um, and when they arrived, very often on the threshold of the place where we were recording, um, they were frazzled, um, sometimes quite silent. Um, they had their issues with the world <laughs> that had put them in this position as moms. Um, and they were not at all certain that they wanted to be there. <laughs> they, they got on the bus, but... <laughs> Um, and they were certainly sure that they could not write, compose, and perform a lullaby. So here again is a place where people like Emily are extremely important as facilitators for this kind of experience. What became evident right away is that a lullaby, its composition, its performance, is actually a two-sided phenomena. Yes, in sort of folkloric terms, it's a gift from a parent, a grandmother, an aunt, an uncle, to a baby. But it's also that occasion is an opportunity for whomever that singer is to experience themselves as a capable and imaginative caregiver. So lots of the phenomena that people have talked about today we really need to think about them as two-sided, as both offering and giving opportunities for delight. And if you think about 
how under any circumstances becoming a new parent is hard work. In this country at this time, to do that work while poor or while single or while hunting for a job is a phenomenal load. So to recognize in the lullabies the opportunity for mothers to experience capability, joy, delight, the possibility of a future is really what we turned out to become very interested in. Yes, there are effects on babies. Yes, they get soothed. Yes, they go to sleep. Yes, eventually they make gestures and communicate. But I think what Emily and I want to really leave you with today is the other side, what it means for the maker and the recipient. But then we were faced with the problem of how do we capture this phenomena? It's actually very difficult. It's tender, it's intimate. And we started out with a very clean research protocol, which was terrible. <laughs> it practically destroyed <laughs> um, by saying to people, oh, use this prompt. And then when you do that, oh, use that prompt. It tore at the very fragile and delicate fabric of this mutual exchange between a teaching artist and the parent who was just at the edge of thinking about him or herself as um, a singer-songwriter. So in the end, what we did was to collect, we just asked teaching artists to run the tape recorder unless somebody said, stop, I don't want this on tape, whatever. And we complemented that with some elicited narratives. So for instance, we asked parents, imagine your son or daughter is 20 years old and he or she finds the lullaby. What's, how would you explain how it came to be? What is it about? So we had two bodies of information, people's accounts of their experience, their daily life. Oh, well, people's accounts of their experience as they wrote the lullaby, and then these elicited narratives. Thanks to the glories of computer analyses of text, we took those and isolated from those, and I will say to you, hours and hours of interchange, um, all of the times when mothers told a story or described an incident in their life. We divided those into what we called in lullaby and out of lullaby. So, um, and then coded them for the categories that we know from studies of well being are indicative of people's sense of living um, a possible and a fulfilled life. So, these are examples of the words that come when mothers describe their lives outside of lullaby. I was just not prepared mentally, physically, or financially. It was difficult keeping him. I don't want her to have a rough growing up like me. So these were accounts of experience and events where positive emotions were swamped by negative emotions, where human relationships were often fragile or broken, where people, women hoped for but couldn't be sure of what would happen for them and for their children. Compare that, if we can have the next one, to their descriptions of themselves in the world of lullaby. I felt very light up in my heart. I was remembering the first time I heard your heartbeat. I see a beautiful future for us. And then one of my favorites, this last one, Making the lullaby was a process of learning myself again. So that's what our descriptive data says. If we get the next one, this is the, the social science of it. And basically what it's telling you is that in all the major categories, which are associated with people's sense of living uh, a fulfilled and a possible life, the accounts told in lullaby are dramatically different than the accounts told 
outside of lullaby. Now, you could say <laughs> you needed to do a study to find this out. Um, yes. Um, what we have here is evidence that a very short, in these particular cases, a three-session intervention can make a dramatic difference in the way that people see their lives. We know from other clinical studies that when you can change the way people see their lives, they, their outlook on their own resilience, the possibilities in the world, their own experiences of physical and psychological symptoms changes. So why does that matter? Well, think about it. A mother is essentially the social-emotional environment for a baby. A mother who is depressed, exhausted, discouraged, lacks confidence in what she is able to do as a caregiver, essentially is an environment in which a baby is often, through no fault of the mother's, but a baby is essentially emotionally malnourished. If we can think about short, low-cost, dependable interventions, which can help to turn that around and to give mothers, dads, grandmothers, who are living in circumstances a different worldview to work from for that baby, then somebody who has the energy and the will to laugh, to play, to make jokes, not to get angry immediately, is a dramatically different social and emotional environment for that baby to be growing up in. So I want you to think with me just for a moment. Imagine a different world. Imagine that prenatal care is not just about climbing on the scales or um, making sure that your blood pressure doesn't go through the roof. Imagine that it also includes elements of self-care, in which, for instance, young mothers in difficult circumstances go through processes like lullaby and become increasingly convinced of their ability to do things that they thought they couldn't do, where they appreciate themselves where they look across a session and see another young mother who was silent, sulking, whatever, when she rocked, flourish. Um, and that we begin to reimagine maternal health in that way as including that kind of imaginative and artistic health as well as just raw physical health. Or imagine well baby clinics and this actually happened some at Jacoby, where at those standard markers of three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months, those are actually celebrations. They are lullaby parties. You bring your lullaby, you bring your baby, you add a verse. And there is an acknowledgement that another three months has passed. You are both alive, present, so are the other people who are in your lullaby class. The nurse practitioners who were with you in Lullaby are still with you. And you have a sense of a group of people who care not only about your physical health, the well baby's immunizations, but also your artistic and emotional health. Then imagine that for the most distressed families, there are nurse practitioner home visits which are based on building the strengths of young, all those struggling families, where book reading, where play, where lullaby are all parts and maybe even central parts of that home visit. And finally, imagine change training for doctors and nurses, where a visit from a young family includes something like the, um, the singing of a joint lullaby, a song, and it's in those naturally occurring imaginative and supportive circumstances that clinicians, whether they're nurse practitioners or social workers or doctors, assess 
the health and well-being of young families. Now, Emily is going to embody this process. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Okay, we just have a few minutes to sing, but I hope you're all ready to do it. After, uh, after a number of presentations about singing, I think it would be really fun to have the experience of what it feels like. And um, I've definitely thought about how it's paradoxical to try to sing lullaby, which is maybe the most intimate form of music you can make in a room that fits 400 people. But it's actually not unlike what it's like to sing a lullaby because no matter where you are in your day as a parent or your life with whatever chaos, you have to create a little cocoon that just includes you and your child. So a little, we're gonna do that, but you're, we're gonna do that with ourselves right now. So are you ready for a little singing? Okay, um, we're actually gonna start with breathing. So if you can take a deep breath, I can hear it. And just for comparison, take, take a fake deep breath. Take the kind of deep breath where someone told you to take a deep breath and you're trying to get ready for something hard. That kind of deep breath. That's not the breath I'm talking about. Try to take a deep breath that's just for you. That increases this feeling like you're in your little cocoon that you can feel in your body. Maybe you feel it in your waist or in your belly. So take, let's take two of those together. One, two. And on the third one, let's just let out a sigh. We can all provide cover for each other, right? Here we go. Ah, that sounds beautiful. That sounds beautiful from here. Okay, um, so that's the beginning of lullaby, believe it or not. Now, what I want you to do is just hum a little bit, again, to yourself. Everyone around you will be humming. And see if you can feel that resonance from the inside. So try that. Mm, just a low, nice hum. Yeah. That sounds amazing. And this, this gets at the idea that this is a really different kind of singing. It's not performative singing, right? It's experiential singing. You're singing to feel it, to fill up your own body with sound. And that's the kind of sound that your baby hears when they're in, the, in your body. The, one of the powerful things about pregnancy is that your child hears you two ways. They hear your voice from the outside, and they also hear the resonance from the inside. So let's have another one of those hums. And even if, even if uh, pregnancy is not part of your life or on your radar, I think you can feel the sense of... Of, of feeling the sound feel good inside. One more time. Mm. That's really good. Okay. Um, so, and, and that leads to what's called an acoustic bridge. When the baby is born, one of the things that calms it is knowing that it hears, it, it has a bridge from the sound that it heard on the inside to the sound on the outside. Okay, now we're going to take that sound, which is a very closed sound, right? And we're going to make an open sound. What would an open sound be? Ah. Let's just do that. Ah, a nice open sound. Yeah, I love it. Let's all do it on a long tone. Ah, and closed and open sounds are the first sounds almost any baby makes in any language. And if we put them together, ma, ma, we get mama, which is no coincidence that in many languages, the name for a parent is the sound that a baby has of feeling their own sound and then also asking for food or opening their mouth, okay? So uh, that's, that's one of the basis of lullabies. And then the other one is the rhythmic part. So let's, um, the first thing I think maybe comes to mind is what? Rocking, I heard rocking, let's rock. You rock back and forth, I can see it, yeah. And then the other thing you may not think of, but is, a, is one of the oldest tricks in the book, is patting. So let's just pat a little bit. Ta, 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 ta. And let's put those together in our voices. So ta, 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 ta. Ta, 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 ta. Yeah. Ta, 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 ta. A little voice. Ta, 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 ta. Really nice. And this leads to the feeling... Um, and first of all, babies and parents communicate in time, as you've heard. And also that uh, babies are trying to communicate, that they want to reach out to their parents. And so, um, and even before words come, parents communicate to their children. And they use, even before words come, the idea of contour. And one of the most prevalent contours to settle a baby is a falling sound. So let's do this. Da, da. And let's put it together with the rhythm. So. Ta, 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 again, ta, 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 and keep that feeling like it's relaxing you so that you can relax a baby. Okay, um, and um, 
one of the special things about it this, that I really love is that a lot of lullabies contain a falling third. So you can hear that mothery or that babbly sound in the voice turn into song. So if we were to s sing a little falling third, what's a word we could sing on it? On na na. What's a word that we could put there? Baby. Let's all do that. Baby. And really sigh on it. Baby. And how about one more little word, a nighttime word? Night, night. Okay, let's sing. Night, night, baby. Night, night, baby. And we already have a little lullaby there. So, um, And maybe this brings up some memories for you of things that you've experienced. Any, anybody, you don't have to say what it is, but anyone suddenly remembering a lullaby from their childhood or something that they sang with other people? Yeah, can you, can you shout one out? Three Little Horses, okay, beautiful. Yeah, so, so in our lullaby projects, we often ask people if they remember either a song or sometimes people weren't sung to, but that feeling of being settled by this kind of crooning. So, um, so when we put it all together, we get into lullaby by trying all these things, and then also through that letter that we have people write, we end up with these really powerful, simple messages. And I'm, we're going to end by teaching you one that I think contains all of these things and more. It's, um, it's one of my favorites, and it's by a mom named Diamond. She wrote it for her two daughters, Akila and Charisma. And uh, in this one, I think you'll hear she really wanted to communicate the, the message that she is here and that she wants her children to know that they can always trust her, that she's never going to leave. It goes like this. It's okay. Try that. It's okay. Mommy's here. She's not going anywhere. She's not going in. Let's sing it together. It's okay. Mommy's here. She's not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. One more time. And this time we're going to do the thing Denny was talking about, which I think is one of the most beautiful things about lullaby, is that it creates this really beautiful relationship between two people. So we're going to actually have this half of the room start it and this half of the room echo. And we're going to be like one big, one big lullaby here, OK? So I'll start you, and I'll let you know when to come in. Here you go. It's okay, it's okay, mommy's here, mommy's here. She's not going, she's not going, she's not going, she. It's okay, it's okay, mommy's here, mommy's here. She's not going, she's not going, she's not going, she's not going anywhere. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to uh, thank all of our uh, speakers today. I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned a few things. Um, we had hoped to have a, a question and answer, but we've run out of time. So we will be in the lobby right outside uh, the auditorium. So if anyone has any questions for any of our uh, speakers, just please join. We'll, we'll be there in a, in a minute or two. Thank you very much. <laughs>